Well, welcome to another lockdown interview. And uh, this time I'm jumping out of the sphere of YouTube and into the world of telly. It is Paul Cowlin from that there Salvage Hunters classic cars and many other things. Hello, how Ian, are you how doing? are you? I'm very well, well. Welcome. You I'm good, thanks, mate. Welcome back from your amazing world tour, which we're all very jealous of watching you going around New Zealand, seeing all the cool spec stuff that we never got over here. Was it good? Yeah. Was it a good trip? Oh, it was an amazing trip. I'm very glad to have made it back before all this kicked off. But um, I was going to say you were very lucky because if you'd have been there, what, another week, you probably would have yeah, been stuck it would there. have been difficult. Yeah, yeah. Although that's not such a bad thing, is it really? I think if you'd have been stuck there, you could have probably managed. Yeah, my girlfriend might not have enjoyed it quite. <laughs> <laughs> we say that. She's probably loving it, to be honest, mate. Oh, maybe. Probably maybe she's glad mass to massively quiet. preferred it. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, I thought um, we'll obviously talk a bit about um, Salvage Hunters Classic Cars in a moment, but I just thought it might be an idea to um, discuss your background a bit more. I mean, this is a bit quite interesting because you've interviewed me a couple of times before, but this is I have. the first time the tables have turned. <laughs> yeah, please so, don't check too, uh, too deeply into my background, everybody, because, you know, who, who knows what might come up? Some of it well, may yeah. not even be legal. Yeah, that's true. So don't, don't uh, dig too deeply. But my background, I've always been, I'm quite a sad individual, really, my entire working life has been based around the motor car from mm -hmm. school. Uh, went into a Saab garage as a, a young lad, became junior salesman and sort of progressed through the ranks there and enjoyed that immensely. Then went into Saab sales and Subaru tuning and then kind of progressed from there into automotive PR, which I still do. And then obviously about 10 years ago, started doing bits and bobs of telly. Started with motors and Eurosport, then mm -hmm. did a show about six years ago, which I think you'd have loved, called Turbo Pickers which was all about buying inexpensive cars and doing inexpensive things to them. And okay. then that sort of progressed into uh, working with my friend Drew. So Drew and I have known each other about six years, met at a party, a discovery party about six years ago, and said, wouldn't it be fun to do a car show together? Mm -hmm. uh, he got offered the chance to do one, and then very kindly uh, put my name forward as the other half. We did a little screen test to see how it went. We just took the mic out of each other for 48 minutes, and... They decided there was a show in that, and here yeah. we are. Basically. Well, look, that, that's one of the things I love. It is that gentle banter between you, and it sort of extends onto social media as well. <laughs> it's, good it's, it's done with much love. Mm. He's like my much, much older brother. That's kind of how <laughs> I think of him. It's done. It's done with that fraternal love, where you know, there's no malice involved, but he is such a ripe source of material, and everything from his age to his dress sense to his hats mm. to you know his his love of Vera Lynn and other things from his childhood, really. Excellent. So um, it, it appears on um, Quest, um, Channel Quest, which I'm... I'm it does. I'm, I haven't had a telly for years, so I'm just getting used to this. But it's well, the nice thing is, mate, you don't need one. You don't need a telly to watch this. You can go on. So it is, it's on Quest, which is Channel 12 on your free view, and on obviously all the Sky platforms as well. Mm -hmm. But um, you can go on to Dplay and completely for free. You don't even have to register or give him your email address, which is always my bugbear when you go onto a streaming Indeed. service. You have to give him your life, don't you? You're inside yeah. the measurement. Quest and Discovery don't ask for any of that. You just go on there. You're going to play some adverts, obviously, because that's what pays for the shows. But you've got to sit through a couple of adverts. You just get to watch it for free. And they've just put all four seasons on. If you want to binge, binge your way through yeah, from the I, first I, series. I have, I have made use of the site to jump onto a, a, a few of them because, um, obviously, not even the telly, I'd, I'd kind of missed out for a bit. I've been out of the country as well. And, um, yeah, it's been interesting to catch up. So how, how would you describe the programme? It's well, two things really. A, it's just two middle aged men bimbling about buying cars and taking bits out of each other. That's generally the show. Mm -hmm. But the other thing, and the thing we're proudest of, obviously, because I come from a motor trade background, is we just wanted it to feel very real. And that came from the whole Salvage Hunters thing. If you've ever watched the Salvage Hunters show, the one where Drew mm -hmm. buys terrible, terrible chairs, uh, that really is following Drew around in his day job. It's obviously crafted for television, but there's very little pretense in that. The only thing mm -hmm. that you sometimes get is a reset of a shot to get a different angle, but everything you see happened, the people he saw he met, the things he bought he bought, they are all available on his website. So when we sat down to do the car show, we thought, well, we've got to take that Salvage Hunters ethos, which is just film the things that happened. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that we, and we thought, let's see, that's what we want to happen, and what do we not want to happen? And the two main things were the whole pretense and jeopardy, which obviously car TV is normally full of. That's what puts me off. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's more of an American thing, really. And obviously, Discovery Channel shows don't have it, but many car shows do. And we just thought we don't want that. And also, you know, the whole kind of artificial problems thing, because if you've been in the trade 25 years like I have, you've seen everything. You've seen blown engines, blown gearboxes, problems, cars you thought were good were not, cars you thought were mm -hmm. bad that aren't. So nothing phases you. And so we said to the producers, look, if we get a problem, and we have had loads of problems, 
we're not going to jump up and down because you don't. If it's a business and it's real life, if you've seen it, you know it's solvable, you know what the solution is, you know it's going to hurt a little bit. Just you crack yeah. on with it and you get your way through. So they're, they're kind of the main things about the show that we are the proudest of. A, it's 99.9% .9 exactly what happened. You know, and when we see those cars for the first time, that is really the first time we've seen them. Mm. Producers are really, really hot on making sure that we never see a car before the day we buy it. So all those reactions yeah. you get are real, the prices are real. And the real kicker is if you see a buyer on the show, that person bought that car. That's the thing. Well, yeah, and, and, and if you don't sell the car, then there's no selling the car shot. Exactly that, yeah. And that, and that was the two things that we kind of wanted, that the buyers have to be real. And, say, and if they don't sell in time for the show, many of them sell afterwards. Mm -hmm. And obviously what uh, really always happens is, say the show goes out on a Wednesday, Thursday morning, the phone rings on the cars that are still available, and they tend to go two days after the show goes out. So, so yeah. It's the best, best advert in the world, is people can see what you've done to them and, and the process that went into them. But something else I really love about the show, and it is, I'm, I'm very much an anti-car programmes on telly. I just find them all a bit too much. Uh, apart from Car SOS, which I can't watch. Cause That's it a great show. Cry. It a just show. upsets me too much. But um, it's, it's the fact you're going to all these places and showcasing what a lot of these companies are doing, the, the proper specialists. Well, that's it, because we, I mean, our, sort of one of our favourite shows and the show that started a lot of this makeover genre is We The Dealers, of course. And mm. Mike and Ant do that so well. And what they do so well is Mike shows you sort of the buying bit and then Ant shows you the fixing bit. And we thought, well, that's been done really to an 11. So you can't repeat that. There's no point doing another We The Dealers because that's pretty much yeah. perfect. But, uh, you know, what can we do that's different? So we thought, well, let's make it less about us and a little bit less about our workshop and more about, like you say, the amazing people out yeah. there in the UK. And it all came about, actually, we started making this. And I'm not going to get political, but whatever your views on Brexit, good or bad, we just thought, well, how do we start to celebrate everything that's wonderful about Britain and all the things that Britain does and makes and fixes and mends. And it started as a bit of a love song, really, and a love poem to the, the great British artisan. And it was all about yeah. friends and sheds, as we call them. Mm -hmm. These little guys, some cases one-man bands or two-man bands, often family businesses, doing incredible work for very sensible amounts of money in most cases. And um, we wanted to showcase that. And the show is yeah. about them. It's less about me and Drew and much more about yeah, and it, it, it's re really good to see. I mean, I often see you retweeting posts by some of these companies. They're loving the attention because, dare I say it, the people who are really, really good at making tiny things and stuff to order aren't necessarily the best at self-promotion. No, I mean, that, you're so right, mate. There's a wonderful story, a couple of wonderful stories. So the very first uh, season we did, uh, a company called GDK Veneering. Do check them out. Mm, I remember seeing that media. one, yeah. And then we did a Mark II Jag and we went to this lovely family and, and Jed is the dad and, he, and he's busy anyway, don't get me wrong, he had plenty of work on. But the morning after the show went out, he rang me and he said, mate, the phone will not start ringing, what do I do? I was like, just oh, get more people. And that's yeah. what he's done. And what's lovely is he had him and his son and like there was sort of two of them, two and a half of them doing the work. They've got seven people now. And wow. he says it's, it's in a huge part down to the amount of inquiries that the show generates. And I don't know if you've yet seen the episode where we did a Renault GTA. No, I haven't yet. Check it out, it's on D-Plane. Uh, right. so Which series things, is that one? I think that's series three, so it's the last series. Right. And it's the car I most wanted to keep. And what was interesting is you could get, because of course the GTA, like a 911, engines at the back, luggage areas at the front. And Renault in period did this beautiful tailored luggage, which of course you can't find. And if you can yeah. find it, it's hideously expensive. So we thought, well, we take that idea of making tailored luggage. And Drew went to a place called Bagworld over in the West Mids. And for 400 quid, they made us an entire set of bespoke tailored luggage that beautifully fitted into the front of this GTA. Gosh. Of course, you don't, you don't waste an inch of space. And we just thought, 400 quid, that's mad for hand-finished, mm. hand-stitched, beautiful luggage, soft bags, sort of bits and pieces, so you can go for your weekend away and have everything you need. Same thing. So the Thursday morning after the show went out on the Wednesday, we were filming some other stuff. For a Saab 96 we're doing and the guy that owns that rang our producer Mike and said I just had 11 inquiries just this morning wow. you think well there's there's four and a half grand's worth of business just off one night show yeah you know, it's it's lovely to think particularly going forward obviously because a lot of these places have had to shut and furlough staff with everything that's going on mm -hmm. it's lovely to think I hope that when we get back to normal that the show will keep playing and keep advertising these businesses and and that's the one thing I would say guys if you're watching this I've been guilty of this. If you go on eBay because it's easy and you just buy some, something for your car because it's convenient because they take PayPal and you don't really know where it's coming from, what we all need to do is just stop, reset. And even if it's a bit more hassle, even if we have to, you know, transfer some cash or 
you know, God forbid, make a bank transfer, whatever it is, just use the little people, the local family businesses, the stuff that's yeah. down the road. Because the other thing is if you support the small businesses, the family businesses, that money tends to stay in that locality as well. So, and if you're buying on your doorstep, the money never goes more than about 50 miles. It stays oh, in. Yeah. And it means so much more to these people if you yeah. spend your money with the smaller companies. It, as a percentage term, that income is just a huge difference to them. It is, and I think we've got to do that as a, as a bunch of classic car enthusiasts, is actively seek these people out. And it is a pain in the bum sometimes, because exactly yeah. what Ian says, they're not great at promoting themselves. We're trying to do our best, but there's hundreds of them. Do a, do a Googling, go on the forums, ask, you know, ask on Twitter. Yeah. Uh, you know, tag, tag me in. If you're trying to find somebody that does something, ask me. If we haven't seen them, I'll just retweet it, and somebody will put their hand up somewhere that, mm. that knows. That's what we should do more as a community, I think, help each other with knowledge and, and get people to find these little pockets of awesomeness and spend with them yeah sounds good and um so, so, some of those skills were definitely um shown with a fiat 130 coupe you did in in this latest series when i saw that i was just like oh this is brave oh yeah i mean we were very lucky there i mean two things i mean we wanted the car problem is you get there we knew it was going to be painful obviously you never really know the problem is when you buy any car that you know is going to be rusty you can have a bit of a poke in a prod when mm. you buy it but obviously you can't start knocking holes in a car that you haven't agreed to buy the only time you can do that is when you've paid for it and you take it home. Then you can do whatever you want because it's yours. So we knew it had holes in it. You knew, we knew it was going to be a massive amount of work. Obviously, the extent of that is not revealed until you get it back and start disassembling. And then it was just basically a collection of holes, that car. But luckily, we've been chatting to this guy called Ashley. And the thing that would have ruined us on that car, I think, had we gone to a professional sort of classic car, super highbrow, high-end place that, you know, hand forms panels over a virgin nun style or something like that. I think that would have killed that restoration. But we found this guy. Oh, yeah, that would have been tens of thousands. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it, it would have wiped us out. But we found this guy called Ashley, um, AG Restoration, I think he's called. I will try and send Ian the thing and can put it in the notes. But he is incredible. He's the ex-pro drive body guy from the mid to late 90s. So he was doing the craze crash rectification. So he's obviously a very talented man. Very busy and man. What, <laughs> very busy man. And what was mad about working with Ashley, because he's obviously used to the stress of being in a service area and a crumpled car comes in. Yeah, he's he got needs six, to be fixed now. Yeah. yeah, and he's got like 60 minutes to get it out. He was a pleasure to work with in so many ways, but a nightmare for our cameraman because he's so fast. Mm -hmm. But he's just, he's forming these panels and they're going, well, we'll slow it down because we need to show the stages of what they're doing. And two things, A, he's super reasonable because he's working in a farm shed, but is incredibly talented. So the, I think the body bill only just got into five figures, which yeah, is mad. Yeah. Which, again, is another thing that I like about the programme, but you factor <laughs> yeah. the actual costs in. Yeah, yeah. But then, then there's paint on top. So body and paint and bits and bobs came to about 20 on that car. But, yeah. I mean, I, I think his bill for what he did, which was basically rebuild most of the exterior of the car, and as you saw, bits of the inner wing, mm -hmm. and did it all to pattern, did it all as if it was the original panel. So once that's kind of all, uh, you know, satin painted and everything, you really struggle to tell. And what I was really impressed with when we went into body, Obviously, because it had to hand form so many of these panels, you do need to put the tiniest skim of filler just to level the car. And I'm talking microns here, you know, mm. just to level the car. But it was, it was literally just microns of filler just here and there, just to, just to level up. It just very yeah. impressive, guys. Very impressive. Yeah. And of course, you had the headlamps in that one as well, but you had to get remanufactured. Yeah. I mean, they, as you say, headlamps are such an important part of a car's face. It's everything, isn't it? It's how a car presents. And what was really interesting there is sort of speaking to the great and the good of the Fiat 130 Coupe world about what we should do. And everybody said, oh, there's this amazing place in Germany. They resilver them, blah, blah, blah. And that's the one that we showed on the show. I think they're about 1,800 euros plus shipping. So it's a thick end of two grand by the time you've got them over. And then we chatted to uh, Cam, who's genius of the lamp over in the jewellery quarter mm -hmm. in Birmingham. And, and they do these beautiful old carriage lamps and vintage and, and almost Victorian cars back to that era. And they've come into the more 60s and 70s stuff. I mean, I don't know if you've seen the show, I would seek it out. It's incredible what they do. But he basically takes that lamp apart, remakes it, but uses, uh, you know, old jewellery methods like silvering and brazing and all yeah. that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah, it's so amazing it was, work. Yeah, so if you see it, I mean, it was better made than Fiat ever made it or Corello ever made it in the mm. first instance. And it was 800 quid. And again, what we always do on the show, one of the other things we insist on is there's no mates rates on the show. We pay retail. And the reason that we do that is because if we got a trade price, problem is everybody would then want to ring up the next day and say oh i saw this thing on your show last night can you do me one of those at the same figure and we kind of bust all these little businesses so yeah we all we always pay retail on screen because it's fair brilliant and it's also it's realistic that you can ring up 
And this is another thing about the show. You can ring up any of those businesses and you'll be charged exactly the same. If you have the same job done, you'll be charged exactly the same as we yeah. are. Because we, we ask the contributor, what price, if somebody rings on Thursday morning, will you quote? Yeah. And, and another thing I love about the show is the attention to detail. I can't remember if it was the sh same show that had the Merck SL in it. It was the same one, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. And um, when that car was first revealed, you first go to look at it. The first thought I had was it was a 1989, I think. Yeah, was it? Uh, it was a 90 registered. It was an 89 production, 90 registered. Yeah. Yeah, and um, I'm looking at it. And I'm going well straight away. That's got the wrong indicators. Yeah. And my girlfriend's looking at me as if to go, what? <laughs> and, and, and then, of course, you corrected it in the show and gave it the ginger caters it was meant to have. Gene, there's a whole movement. There's even on Instagram, there's a fabulous ginger caters uh, feed. Have you subscribed to that? No, no, I think I need I've got to. Instagram. I can't remember. It's one of the uh, journalists or PR guys. I can't remember which one it is now, but he's got a ginger caters feed and it's fabulous and it's a celebration of all the cars. Because I was guilty of this very much in the late 90s, early noughties. I just was very my, much... my, my Invercar has been de ginger -cated. What? Yeah. I'm guilty. It's become, it's become cool. So, of course, in the uh, um, early noughties, we were basically putting clear indicators on everything because that was the fashion. Yeah. And now, now that kind of old is cool again, that we, we're rewinding everything back to putting it to stock. And on this R129 uh, 500 SL, we just, we just wanted it. I think, to me, the appeal of that car is the fact those very early cars had a real sharpness of line, a cleanliness of yeah. line that I think got a little bit lost when they did the facelift in the mid-90s, which was a mm. good facelift. To me, it lost what the car was all about. And that car, being the two-tone, having the blue interior, wanted to go right back to showroom fresh. The one thing we did do, though, that we didn't mention in the show, it got lost in the edit, and nobody noticed, is we put spacers on the back and tiny spacers on the front. Wheel ah. spacers. Because if you look at a showroom shot or a brochure shot of those early R129s, particularly the 500, the wheels are massively tucked. They're, there's a two-inch tuck on those wheels. Mm -hmm. God knows why. It's almost like the wheels, the rear wheels are the wrong offset. It's always bothered me about the car. So what we did is we put 20 mil space on the back, I think, and a 10 or 15 on the front. And if you look at the, go back and watch the footage, you'll see it I'm going to have to watch again, though. Yeah. Yeah, it sits perfectly. To me, it sits how the car should have sat from the factory, just kind of about five mil away from the edge of the arch. Mm. It just, it's got so much more muscular and squat. So we kind of did that, because again, you know, 70 quid to do that. So nice yeah. cheap fix. Yeah. So, um... At the time of recording, I think I might manage to get this interview out before. It's on Wednesdays, isn't it? It is Wednesdays, yeah. Do you, do you know what's in next week's show? I do. In next week's show, we've got a very interesting Alfetta GTV that's Ooh. not red. Well, the, other thing it's not, the other thing it's not is rusty, believe it or not. It's a, British, it's, it's a British right-hand drive car that has never been restored. And if you want to find out why it's not rusty, because it must be the only one in the world, um, find out on Wednesday. Yeah. That's my little, little tease there. And the other thing we do, which is a car that I've always loved because my dad's got a Tiger, we do a Sunbeam Alpine as well. Lovely. Which for nerdy car people out there, of course, was the first Bond car, wasn't it? The first James Bond mm. car was Sunbeam Alpine. So we thought we'd do one of those as the first Bond car and we found a really nice one. And it was quite cheap and a good colour. And That's again, so, so underrated. I love them. Yeah. They, dri they drive. I mean, it was a good car. They drive so beautifully as well for that era mm. of car. But everything that you get, you know, you get the Bond connection, you get the fact it's a poor man's tiger. I think a very beautiful bit of styling. Mm -hmm. Because, of course, it Definitely. was designed to appeal to Americans. That's the whole point of the car. It was designed to be an export success. So, to me, it always looks a bit like a baby 57 Thunderbird, I think. Put mm -hmm. around the headlights and the bonnet line. It's got that kind of Definitely. look to it. Yeah. Uh, and it's just a cool car. Again, cool car, pocket money. We met some great people in the fixing of that car. And it's, it just turned into a lovely little thing. And it's just a real pleasure to do. Drew's not a massive fan of 60s British sports cars, but I am. So he just moans the whole way through the half of that episode, which is standard, really. Well, yeah, I mean, if, if you both loved everything the same, it wouldn't be such an entertaining show, would it? it it's the well, difference it. is the different tastes that actually make that chemistry. Uh, uh, yeah, and sometimes we massively agree. I mean, there's a, a Volkswagen Beetle coming up in which it'll be very annoying television because we agree on every single thing. And that's the other thing we won't do. We won't kind of make up a, a disagreement. If we love it, we love it. If we hate it, we hate yeah. it. Good. I'm quite annoying in the fact I love most cars. I don't see many cars. I think a bit like you, mate. I can find some. Yeah, I'm a bit like that. Yeah. In most vehicles. I've never seen a car I absolutely hate. I can find some. And I understand as well, it's, it's somebody's idea of a perfect car. Every mm. car is somebody's dream, isn't it? So I'm, I'm kind of keen. But what I love about working with Drew is Drew is super opinionated and super honest. And if he loves a car like this Beetle, which we both fell in love with, he's straight on it. And if he hates it, he is so vociferous in his anger. And it just comes out. 
Mm. So it makes for an interesting build. So the sun being, I had to kind of let him, like a little kid, I had to kind of let him go, like, you can go and colour bits of that in because he wants to paint that bit black and he wants to do that. It's like, well, you go off and play over there and, and you, you with your pens and colour bits in. And he did that and that kind of distracted him, which allowed me to then finish the rest of the car how it should be done. Excellent. So that was rather nice. And yeah. the Alpha actually, it's interesting because it was such a, a plain level car and it was so honest. And we didn't have to do that much to it. And you'll see in the show, it's an unbelievable, it's genuine barn fine car that just seemed to have spent its entire existence in a place that didn't corrode. So I don't know how no. or what happened there, but it, no, it look, didn't. Look, I look forward to watching it. Yeah, it was I bought it from New, actually, which was interesting as well. So maybe that's one of the reasons. So Yeah, excellent. Um, we should probably jump away from the programme a bit because um, I think it'd be quite interesting to talk about some of the cars you own yourself. Oh, okay. That, that could take a while. Yeah. Well, what would you say <laughs> is the most interesting car you own? Is it quite the collection? There's a few, aren't there? There's a yeah. few. Uh, my car taste, if you don't know, and I've never really published them anywhere, what I've got. I've got a very eclectic collection of stuff. And so I'm a car collector, but it doesn't have to be grand or flash or expensive. One of the cars that's brought me the most joy in the last two years is a 800 quid Audi 80. Mm. Kind of the typical one old boy car, beautiful colour, uh, really rare colour as well, automatic, wrong yeah, engine. Com wrong completely gear. worthless. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, I paid 860 quid for it on a good day with the wind in the right direction. It's probably worth 15, 600 quid because it's so nice. But you drive it around and it's almost like being transported back in time to 1991 when it was built. And you just think, what a lovely way to travel. So I'm like yeah. you, cars don't have to be flash or expensive. They need to be quirky or interesting and I need to have some connection to them. And then so stuff like that I find interesting. I bought a beautiful Peugeot 505 Familial, which is the big estate, the seven-seat estate. Funny enough, when we were filming the show, went to Brightwell's auction in Lempster to buy an MGA, which you will see on the show later in the series, and there, tucked in the corner, freshly imported from Portugal, was a beautiful, beautiful, stunning metallic green, 38,000 kilometres. Yeah. You've, you've managed to sneak that into... The, the, there's a thing on Quest where it's all the presenters talking about the situation we're in at the moment. You've managed yeah, to yeah. sneak that in the background, haven't you? Well, oh, well spotted. So that's, there, that's, that's the shot. Actually, if you look at the... Uh, there is an advert, as Ian says, of us saying stay at home, as we're all doing. And if you look, that's me in front of some of my car collection there. So that kind of room is, is part of my car collection. Mm -hmm. So you'll see it there. And it's, that's amazing, because that was two grand plus buyers premium. Wow. 38,000 kilometre uh, sure. Peugeot. Which, if you look underneath, uh, it's got the, the 2.2, that one. The 2.1? Right. No, Is it 2.1? Yeah, 2.1. Um, but it's not a manual, um, full history, just... I mean, you could, if you were that way inclined, you could concourse it, probably, in a couple of afternoons. It's, it's that clean. Underneath, yeah, just all the... turn up at a big, shiny show with your huge pair show. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, all, underneath, all the bolts are galvanised. And wow. still, because it's never seen rain, it's lived in mm -hmm. Portugal its entire life. And I guess looking at it, the very hot part of Portugal, it's been garage, so it's not, it's got no sun damage because it's never seen rain, so it's got no water damage either. So it's just that thing, and all the seals are like brand new, all the rubbers are perfect. Mm -hmm. Two grand. So those cars excite me very much, as I know they do, you mate, kind of cars that yeah. cost you know, one or two grand that are just immense amounts of fun. Then at the other end, I've got a really weird car, and my friend Alex Coyer made a brilliant film on it. So do Google that. It's called a Pontiac Tojan, and most people will never heard of it. And the only reason I know hopefully about it is we can post a picture up of it somewhere around here. Oh, nice, great production yeah. values. So it's going to be there. Yeah, just there, right over there. your face. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's better. Um, and it's a weird car. So in the 1980s, Pontiac decided they wanted to go toe to toe with Ferrari and build a blue collar supercar and use a Pontiac Trans Am GTA frame. Went to a coach builder called Nudson Automotive. He said, "Build a car that will look a bit like a Ferrari." and go over 200 miles an hour. Now in America, obviously the small block V8s, of which are very many, mm -hmm. the offshore powerboat racing, the F1 powerboat racing, generally speaking at the time, a lot of those engines were based around small block V8s. So what they did is pretty much stuck a boat engine into this car, which on race fuel runs 900 horsepower and there's uh, oh. timing slips and dyno slips of it in period when it was built in 84, running over 900 horsepower because it's got two dustbin sized turbos. And then it ran, there's an SCCA timing slip for the car, which came with it, 206 miles an hour, the car ran that, which is so scary, because I've driven it on a private test track, I'm stress, at 140, and it generates enormous lift above 140. 
So I don't know who drove it at 206, but I would like to shake them by the hand. Yeah, they, pro they probably had an, um, an, an air pilot. Um, just <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it pretty much turns into an aircraft above 140. And mm. I don't take it any high because it was really getting unstable. And so because the aero is all over the place, it was never really designed. It looks quite cool, but in a weird way. It looks like mm. the love child of an 80s 300 ZX. You can see bits of Pontiac. You can see bits of Lamborghini Jalper in there. There's all sorts of weird influences. But check it out. The film is, is mega. Alex explains it better. Mm -hmm. It's so weird. So that was a prototype. They, they put the stupid engine in the prototype. Apparently, the test driver said, I've, I've read a contemporary interview, and he said, I'm never driving that again. It's lethal. So the, for the production version, they just put in a, a cooking V8, mm -hmm. you know, a couple of, hundred, couple of hundred horsepower. And then yeah, he made got, got their headline figure, and then oh, a bit like Jaguar back in the day would always massage the press cars a bit, wouldn't they? Yeah, exactly like that. So the car did its 206. They then did 135 other cars with a cooking engine, and then they just stopped the program because it just didn't sell very well. Because the car was twice the cost of a standard Trans Am. So, of course, nobody bought one. So no. I love that. I love spectacular failures. That is a spectacular failure. So have a look at that one. That's the good yeah. one. Yeah. Certainly will do. And don't you, um, for your company, look after um, some of the Subaru UK cars as well? Yeah, yeah. Well, so I've, I've got a lot of weird and wonderful Subaru. So I've sort of grown up, I sold Subaru in the late 90s. I tuned them in the early noughties. So Subaru's been a huge part of my life and paid huge checks into my mortgage. And I still work with them as a brand. In fact, I'm going to do some stuff for them next week, actually. From home, of course. Mm. Uh, but I've got some weird and wonderful cars. So I've sort of inherited their Subaru 360, uh, which is like their little heritage I'm car. desperate to come and play with that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it doesn't run at the moment. I need to get it really oh. working. But you're very welcome to come and sit in and I'll push you around the yard because it weighs That would probably work, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a really nice XT Coupe, which is a weird and wonderful. Again, you might not know these cars. Worth checking out. Yeah, the XT, else? very odd. Yeah. Very weird car, and I managed to find one uh, that was imported over from Washington, of all places, but not rusty. I've got an L series, which is the first Subaru WRC rally car. Again, all this stuff's worth a Google. People always think the legacy was Subaru's first entry into rallying. It wasn't, it was the L series. I've got one of those. I've got a beautiful classic impress that Drew bought first, mm -hmm. which was too good for him. And he realized he was just going to ruin it. Because again, one owner from new, 22,000 miles, full history. Wow. So, Real that's kind of the car that's thing. only going to go up in value. Yeah, well, it's, it's very nice. It's never been touched either. So no options other than the ProDrive rear wing and the speed lines. But apart from that, completely as it left the dealership. So very, very cool bits and pieces. What else have we got? I've got a really nice STI, which we did with Subaru in 2012. A BRZ, which was the first one registered, which became the accessories development car. Mm -hmm. And I've got, an S I've got an SVX, which I just think is the coolest thing. Yes, they're, they're one of those utterly remarkable cars with those sort of concept car like restricted drop down windows. And yeah, it's what they call glass to canopy, designed by Gijaro. And um, it's just very, very cool story behind that because obviously, what's the car you want? You want a car that's designed by the Italians, ain't you? Built by the Japanese. It's almost the perfect compromise. Mm -hmm. And Subaru, at the time, you've got to think we're kind of known for farming vehicles and sort of recreational vehicles. The coolest thing they'd done up to that point was the Brat. Mm -hmm. and really it was all about the kind of very square looking estates and the xt coupe they'd done they weren't really known as this sports car manufacturer again they wanted to go toe to toe with the likes of porsche and the 928 and the 944 and they they hired jaro to build this incredible concept i think it's the 1989 tokyo motor show they launched it with a big chin spoiler on mm -hmm. and everyone just went wow you'll never build it and they built it they built it pretty much with the exception of the massive chin spoiler as per the motor show concept which again never happens. I love it when no. concept cars get shown and then they make them as per the concept car. I'll have to check that out because I, I thought the Nissan Figaro was like the, the ultimate of going from concept to production and changing nothing at all. Well, I love that because I've got a Dodge Challenger as well, the SRT from 2010, which of course was released in 2009. And again, if you look at the original Dodge Challenger, the rebirth of the Dodge Challenger, they put this concept car out and everyone went, wow. And again, if you look at the production version, they changed so little. Mm. And I always admire it. I always admire it when manufacturers come out with something bold and don't water it down. The other yeah. car I drove recently, which I think is a, a real future classic, and I'd love to own one, is a Lexus LC500, which is that beautiful sort of space age coupe with a full fat V8. And it's a brilliant story. So Lexus do this thing at Pebble Beach every year where Apio Toyota, the head of Toyota and Lexus, kind of goes there. And a few years ago, he went and they were saying to him, mate, love your cars, you know, Beautifully built, so reliable, but they're a bit boring, aren't they? So he was a bit offended, as Japanese people, you know, loss mm -hmm. of honour. 
they came back a year or so later with um, this beautiful concept, which was a Lexus LC sort of concept thing. And everyone went, yeah, great concept, mate, but you'll never build it, will you? You'll never build it. And if you do, you'll, you'll never build it like that. And of course, they built this car as a concept, never thinking they were going to have to productionize it. So if you look at the height from the top of the tire to the top of the wing, it's tiny. Because you've then got to try and fit a full production suspension unit in that. But what mm -hmm. I admire about that car is he then went back to his R&D team and said, build that car. You're not allowed to change anything. You just wow. make it production. Right? And then that they, if you look again, look at the concept, look at the car, they change about three things. Really brave. Very cool when people do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, Fascinating stuff. I've got all sorts. I mean, lots of old Volkswagens, because that's what I started with. My first love is always air-cooled Volkswagens. A lot of old Saabs, because I worked for Saab for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, just lots of American bits and bobs. I've got a Knight Rider replica. But there's, there's, there's no right or wrong car for my collection. I think it's cool, and I like it. And particularly if it's the right money. Mm -hmm. That's the other thing. So that's my version of savings. I don't have a penny in savings. It's all in my car collection. And then if it all goes tilt tomorrow, which it might do, blimey, never know. Um, I just start selling them. That's yeah, maybe we'll, maybe we'll all get used to not driving and think, what are we doing? We don't need these cars anymore. <laughs> in which case, you and me are both in trouble. We are, because that's where all our money sits at the moment, yes. really. But what's nice about having a car collection, so we can't drive them at the moment, but you can at least look at them. So if you've got it in a bank account, you can look at it. It doesn't do you any good in the bank account, certainly not making you any money. Mm -hmm. And you get no enjoyment from having your savings in a bank. Whereas if you have it in a car, whether it goes up or down, hopefully it goes up, but yeah, mm. occasionally they go down. You, can, you still get the enjoyment from it, don't you? It's like a holiday. When you put £2,000 into a holiday or 500 quid into a holiday, you never get that money back, but you get the enjoyment of the holiday, don't you? Yeah, indeed, yeah. You, you have to look at it that way with a classic car. You might make some money on it, you might not, but if you've enjoyed the time you spent on it, whatever that money cost you, it was worth every penny. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot to be said for that, and um, oh. especially in these times, um, yeah, fun is definitely something to... Um, get involved with yeah uh, definitely I, I, i'm just so frustrated at the moment i've only got one car my little citroen gs <laughs> the only car i've got and for me to have just one car i've got access to it, it it's um yeah a very unusual situation but that's a cool car though mate, isn't it of all the cars to buy i mean when was the last how many's left of those um, i'm not sure either? in total um i could probably find out and put it down here somewhere because i Do have it. people I'm who will know it's got to be tens or very low hundreds, doesn't it, I'd have thought. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's been a few imports from places where it doesn't rain quite so much. But, uh, yeah, they, they um, sadly did succumb to rot quite badly. Did you see, actually, if you want to watch a really cool thing and have a, a moment, an underpants moment, so there's an episode in the last series where we buy an NSU, mm -hmm. and in the corner... Oh, of yes, the, I saw that. Yeah, There's, a, there's a GS Byrotor in the corner. I mean, yeah. That's a great story as well. It's worth uh, researching you guys. So Citroen did a wankle, no laughing at the back, uh, mm -hmm. engine in the GS, thinking it would be good. As with a lot of wankle engines early on, they weren't and had a lot of warranty issues. So many warranty issues, they decided that the car should be cancelled and all the dealers had to basically scrap the cars and to prove they'd scrap the cars, they had to send the VIN plate back. That's how it worked. Of course, a lot of dealers just sent the VIN plate back and said, yeah, yeah, I've definitely scrapped it. <laughs> Yeah. So a lot of the a lot of the cars do still exist from the yes. dealers, and they they were squirrelled away in barns and sheds somewhere, and they are still out there. And this car was particularly beautiful and very original. Yeah, I, I, I'm aware. I think, I think there's actually a couple of them in the UK now. And, yeah. Um, again, post lockdown, I do hope to get my hands on one, but. Yeah, the well, moment. I'll, I'll hook you up with Phil if you want Phil's details. Um, he's, he certainly one. looks a very interesting person to talk to. Well, he's got 30 NSU row 80s as well, which mm. I think as, as a proportion, according to the DVLA, you can never be too sure on how many left, can you, how accurate it is. But Indeed. He, see, he seems to have somewhere between about 60 and 70% of the UK's uh, row 80s. So he's an interesting yeah. guy. That's a car I would very much like to spend more time with. I've driven the one Volkswagen UK owns, but I would like to spend, you know, a week or two, if not longer, with one. And uh, maybe I'll have to buy one at some point in the future. I think you should, because they're massively undervalued. And what really yeah. blew our mind, because I'd only ever driven one for about five minutes prior to buying one for the show. And what blew both Drew and my minds was, it, I mean, it's a 68 design, isn't it? 67 design. 66. But yeah, it drive, drives, like drives like a 10-year-old car. Yeah. Unbelievable in terms of how smooth and fluid it is, how refined the engine feels. Once you get used to the slightly weird transmission, it's, it's astonishing, that car. Absolutely astonishing. Yeah, and you just can to just... think that, that, that's a time when Volkswagen Beetles, Morris Miners, Morris Oxford yeah. still being sold. And 
The last thing yeah. you put it into what it was for sale against at the time, and that was an expensive car, but you know, engine problems or not, that's an incredible piece of engineering. And what yeah. I love about those cars is, you know, they have an unfair reputation now. And I think the reason they're so cheap is people are scared off by the engine. But it's like so many cars, it's like the RX-8. If you go to a good specialist and if you do you know, use modern oils and, and do all the tricks that these guys have learned over the years, they're no more grief than any other classic. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. I think one of the tricks is actually to fit Mazda Apex seals to the um, yeah. SU engines. So modern technology, because Mazda just kept on developing it, we're able to benefit and make the NSUs reliable. Yeah, well, just a really cool car. We both fell in love with that car. That was one of the cars we didn't want to sell, but unfortunately sold very quickly. Yeah, you, can, you can't keep them all. <laughs> no, I would if I could, believe me. Super. Well, um, we've quickly managed to blast through um, half an hour there of um, chat. So. Well, that's probably enough, I think, for most people. Yeah, that, that's probably... gone very quickly indeed. But yeah, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Um, obviously, people can find you on Twitter. Yeah, Twitter and Instagram. I'm Paul Cowland underscore because uh, the other Paul Cowland is a much fitter personal trainer from Brighton than he got there first. So yeah, you could probably follow him. It's probably more interesting and you will get fitter. But mm -hmm. my, and none of my activity is based around fitness. And just before I go, I just, I just want to compliment Emma on um, your lovely haircut. I think I, oh, I'm, thanks, about, yeah. I'm about due one myself. Um, lockdown hair um, care is definitely proving problematic. It looks good though, mate. You could always go back to your old style and just bring that back, couldn't you? I, I could. That would be the lazy option, just grow it all again. I mean, <laughs> the, the beard's getting nice and bushy and, yeah. Bob, when we're getting grey now, because we're well into our 40s, all the grey bits are coming through. So if I don't keep it short at the side, you start to see it goes very grey. So I just keep yeah, shaving yeah. it. Yeah, aware of that. Very aware of that. <laughs> we're just gentlemen of a certain age, mate, aren't we? Yeah, yeah, we are. But yeah, obviously, well, um, look out for Salvage Hunters Classic Cars um, on Quest and on dplay.co.uk. Yeah, dpay.co.uk is completely free. Um, and if you obviously can't get on because you're from another country, because now you have fans all over the world, I'm sure there will be some kind of um, dodgy router thing you can do where you go, um, all the IT nerds will know how to do it. As long as you can't see the uh, geographic specific IP, you can watch Indeed. it in there. Yeah. Excellent. Well, yeah, well, well, thank you very much. And um, yeah, all the best for lockdown. And um, thanks, man. I will actually get to come and visit you at some point. Well, let's do another bit. We'll have a day. Here's a promise that we're going to make to you now, both of us, that when this is back to normal, he's going to come over, have a bit of dinner with us, and we're going to we'll go through some of the Cowland collection. We'll drive the Tojan together. How about that? We'll go oh, that years. would be awesome, yeah. But your, your challenge in between then and now is to grow a mullet to suit the car. Oh, right, okay. That, that may well be possible in this lockdown period. <laughs> <laughs> All right, buddy. I'll see you soon. Yeah, thanks. Farewell. Take care, mate.